Uh, this, today we continue our summer in the minor leagues, and uh, today especially we do that in a couple of different ways. I've already mentioned our trip to the Greenville Drive game this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, we do have a couple extra tickets if there's anybody who has uh, not yet signed up who would still be interested in going. Uh, but even beyond that, we don't have a monopoly on the Greenville Drive tickets today. So if you want to join us, we would love to, to be able to see you out at the ballpark. Uh, so you, we can't necessarily promise that we can get those group discounted rates uh, for any more tickets. But we've got about 30 people headed over to the game, and we would love for you to join in on that. Uh, we're going to have a good time over there. You know, the minor league baseball, what, when, you, when you go to a minor league baseball game, um, unless you're a fan of that particular organization or if you follow, unless you follow that team fairly closely, uh, there's a pretty good chance that you go and you watch a baseball game and you watch people that you've never heard of uh, play a game that you love. That's kind of how the minors works. Uh, there's several different reasons that someone might be in the minor leagues. Uh, probably the most obvious reason is that they're not yet in the major leagues. They're still working on their skill. They're trying to to climb that ladder within the organization. Now, as we continue our summer in the minor profits, uh, we want to remember that that is not a good comparison for these 12 men that we're studying. It's not because they're still working on their prophecy. You know, they're still trying to work things out, and eventually they might get promoted to the major leagues. We've been saying all summer that the word minor, as it refers to the minor profits, uh, has nothing to do with their importance or their significance or even their popularity, it just talks about uh, the, the brevity of their writing in comparison to the major prophets of like Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, much, much longer books. Uh, we're going to see one of the longer books today. Uh, I think the, the longest of the minor prophets is 12 to 14 chapters, but they're not still working their way up. So one reason you might see a minor league player in the minor leagues is because they haven't quite reach the majors. But then there are some other reasons that you might see somebody who is typically a major league player who has to play for a particular season, uh, even if it's just a few days, uh, in the minor leagues. Uh, I can think of uh, three reasons in particular. Uh, one is if you're struggling with the fundamentals. You know, if you're, if you're kind of having some difficulty uh, playing second base, turning a double play, doing whatever it is that you do, uh, maybe working on a new pitch if you're the pitcher. A lot of times players will get sent down to the minor leagues because they need to brush up on the fundamentals. Uh, another reason, they might be rehabbing an injury. They, they might uh, have injured a particular part of their body and they, they can't just jump back into main competition, so they get sent down to the minor leagues so they can kind of get used to playing again. And then the third reason I can think of is if they're playing a new position. Uh, I know one of, the, one of the Braves players that uh, used to play for the Braves, Jordan Schaefer, is now in the Dodgers organization. He played outfield for the Braves. He now is a pitcher for the Dodgers. So you don't just do that at the major league level. You've got to go down and kind of work your way back up. The reason I say all those things is because those three reasons are a, a little bit similar to what we find in the minor prophets. Working on fundamentals rehabbing, in this case, a, a spiritual injury. What we see as we, as we read these 12 different prophets is that God's people were spiritually injured. They were spiritually sick at this particular time. And so God sent the minor prophets to them to help them rehab so that they wouldn't have another position. Uh, one of the truths that we see in the minor prophets is that uh, depending on which one we're looking at at which time in history, uh, they are prophesying that if God's people don't get their act together, if God's people don't repent and get back on the right path, then God is going to give them a new position. And we see that as he uh, carries his people off from the northern kingdom of Israel uh, into captivity in Assyria. Uh, we see it later on as uh, God carries his people off from the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity in Babylon. So we're continuing to look at the minor prophets this summer. And we'll look at one prophet uh, each week, so we'll cover all 12 this summer. But we're doing that so God can work on the fundamentals of our life, so He can rehab us through some difficulties that we're going through, and that maybe He can give us a new position, a new position, especially today, of, of humility. We're going to see that uh, later on at the end of the service. But a little bit of information uh, about Micah. Now, you see a couple of blanks there. 
uh, in the sermon handout. Uh, the first thing that we see about Micah is he was prophesying in the 8th century B.C. Uh, so we've already looked at uh, Hosea and Amos and also Jonah. Uh, all those guys are, are ministering there in the 8th century B.C. And in particular, with Micah, we see that he is a contemporary of Isaiah, one of those major prophets that we, that we hear a lot more about and read a lot more about. And there are several places throughout the Scriptures, particularly in the historical books of the Old Testament, First and Second Kings, for example, where we find information about how Micah and Isaiah really, they tag-team. They, the, they were the double play combination uh, on God's uh, baseball field of prophecy. And so we see that he is a contemporary of Isaiah. We also see, uh, as we look at his book, that, uh, that Micah is prophesying primarily in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, if you haven't been with us the last several weeks, just a reminder of kind of how God's people are divided at this particular time. Uh, when God brought his people into the promised land, they were obviously, they were one people, and uh, eventually they, they were led under a particular king. Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. Uh, didn't, didn't do such, such a good job, and so David followed him, and uh, David's son Solomon followed him. But after Solomon's reign on the throne, God's people divided into two kingdoms. And so we have the, the northern kingdom of Israel, which represented ten tribes, and we have the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, one of the things that you have to remember as you're reading through the Minor Prophets, we've talked about this before, is that oftentimes... Uh, the prophets will use the name of the prominent cities to refer to the entire nation or to the entire kingdom. For example, when we hear of Samaria, which is the capital city of the northern kingdom, we know that the prophet is talking about the northern kingdom. Today we're going to hear a little bit about Jerusalem, which is the capital city of the southern kingdom. But Micah is prophesying primarily to that southern kingdom. Now what we see in chapters 1 and 2 is that he is is actually prophesying the fall of the northern kingdom. So he's, he's still talking to those guys in the south, but he's using their neighbors to the north as an example. And he's, he's basically telling them, listen, they're not going to get their act together, and God is going to send the Assyrians in, and they're going to wipe them away. Uh, they're going to totally bring them into captivity. And, of course, we see this happening historically in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians absolutely destroy the capital city of Samaria, and take God's people into captivity in Assyria. And Micah continues his prophecy primarily to that southern kingdom, basically saying, listen, they didn't get their act together, and look what God did. We need to get our act together. Because he knew that the Assyrians were not the only ones on the scene. God also would use the Babylonians a couple centuries later. And so Micah wants to prepare God's people to make a turn. And to come back to him. I want to jump in uh, in the book of Micah in chapter 6. So uh, turn in your Bible with me to Micah chapter 6. Uh, if you are using a pew Bible this morning, you should be able to find uh, the book of Micah on page 658. Uh, there are a couple of different versions of pew Bibles. So if that's not exactly the right page, uh, it should get you in the right neighborhood. Uh, but as you find your place in Micah chapter 6... Uh, stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to read to begin with uh, a very short passage that, uh, that culminates with that last verse, uh, Micah 6, 8, that we have been singing already this morning and that is going to uh, be the format for our uh, time of, of teaching together this morning. So follow along in your scripture as I read Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow, bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, for the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Three 
simple little steps, but not three easy little steps. Uh, three, three principles that God will have to work mightily on us uh, if we are to carry them out. Let's ask Him to do just that. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the truth of Your Word. We're thankful for uh, Micah's ministry to the southern kingdom. Uh, Father, we, we pray that He might minister to these southern people today. Uh, we pray that uh, we might not see His words simply through a historical lens, but that we might recognize this morning that you continue to talk to us. Uh, You continue to reveal yourself to us, and your requirements haven't changed. Uh, Father, we pray that as we look to your word this morning that you might teach us how to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's just look at that verse again, Micah 6, 8. Uh, Notice in your your teaching outline this morning that you, you you already have the main points of the outline, those, those three different verbal imperatives, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. So let's, let's see what the Lord has uh, for us as we, as we think about each of these uh, three different requirements that God has for us. First of all, the idea of, of doing justice. Turn back in your scripture to, to Micah chapter 3. Uh, We're we're obviously not going to read the entire book of Micah this morning, but we're going to kind of jump around from one place to another to to get the heart of the message of each of these three requirements, to understand what Micah's talking about uh, originally with the the people of Jerusalem, and then how the Lord wants to use those words to continue to work on us this morning. But look at what he says in in Micah chapter 3 and in the first couple of verses, Uh, and I said here... You heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? Now, what is the answer to that question? This is a rhetorical question, but what's the answer to that question, church? Yes, God is talking to the leaders of His people. He's talking to those who, uh, who, who demonstrate leadership among his people, the priests and the prophets, and, and yes, even the kings. And he is saying to them, is it not for you to know justice? Don't you, aren't you the ones that should know above anyone else what it's supposed to look like to do justice in my sight? But look at what he says at the beginning of verse 2. You who hate the good and love the evil. Does that verse sound right? You who hate the good and love the evil. Is that what they're supposed to be doing? Now, let me remind you what we read in Amos. Uh, Look at Amos chapter 5. You don't need to necessarily turn over there in your scripture, but you you might just want to make a note of that verse right here beside Micah 3, 2. Listen to what we read in Amos 5, 15, as God is giving instructions to his people about what he expects from them. And he says, hate evil and love good. And establish justice in the gate, and it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And so Amos was was prophesying doom among God's people because they too were not carrying out justice in the land. And God said to them very simply, hate evil and love good. But notice what we read about these leaders in Israel, these leaders in, in Jacob, in Judah, You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off from my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Those are are beautiful verses, aren't they? I don't know how many of you watched the, the television show Criminal Minds. That used to be one of my favorite shows. Uh, and then a funny thing happened. I, I talked about it in a sermon one day several years ago. 
And so you know a lot of the people in the church who never watched it, they're going to tune in the next weekend, right? And it was the worst, most violent, risque episode in the history of Criminal Minds. So don't watch Criminal Minds. But if you were to watch Criminal Minds, this is the kind of stuff that you see. I mean, this is, this is Jeffrey Dahmer type description right here. You, you tear the skin off people. You, you rip their flesh off. You chop them up and you put them in the pot to stew. That is, that is awful stuff. And as we sit here in this sanctuary, I can't imagine that any of you might think that you fall into that category. You might think, man, that is heinous stuff. I would never do anything like that. Well, I can guarantee you the leaders of Israel wouldn't have described their actions like that either. You see, we need to remember that this is, this is from God's perspective. And we need to understand that when God views our sin, when He views the way we treat each other and our lack of justice among each other, His description of our actions are far different from ours. If, if we got to hear God's perspective on the condition of our heart, we would not like it. That's why we need to repent. One, the word repent in the Scripture means to change our mind, to have a change in our thinking and to repent. We need to have a change in our thinking based on our own actions. We need to stop viewing our actions the way we view them and start viewing them the way God views them. These are some awful, awful words that we read about in Micah. Skip down to verse 8. Uh, Micah says, uh, As for me, I am filled with power. Uh, Trying to find what chapter that might be. It's obviously the wrong chapter here. Three eight. We'll come back to that one in just a few moments. Let's talk about what it means. Let's talk about what it means to do justice. You know, as I prepared for this passage, as I prepared for this week. That word justice is, is pretty common in our country, right? Where do we most often hear that? First, first, first thinking, if I say the word justice, what do you think of? The courts, where, where, where right is done, where we do the right thing. I, I don't know about you, but I also think about the Pledge of Allegiance. Anybody else thinking about the Pledge of Allegiance? With liberty and justice for all. And one of the things that the Lord has really hammered home into my heart this week is that we are a people who love the idea of justice. We, we love justice as a value. We, we love to talk about it. But notice, notice the command here. What is the command about justice? Do it. Do justice. God is saying, I don't want you just to esteem justice. I don't want you just to talk about justice. I don't want you to just to, to, to have conversations about it. I want you to do justice. Now, let's talk about a couple of different ways that that happens. Number one, we have to treat people rightly, regardless of of their vulnerability. Treat people rightly regardless of their vulnerability. One of the things that we read about in the book of Micah is how uh, people were being displaced. Those verses, I found them. Thank you, Lord, for helping me find those verses. It's actually chapter 2. Let's look at those verses again. It's actually chapter 2, verse 8. Lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. I, I think what we have here in, in verses 8 and 9 is just, just one little example of what it looks like to do injustice. These are people who are taking advantage 
of the people they can take advantage of. They're taking advantage of the women. They're taking advantage of the children. They're, they're removing them from their houses. And God says, I want you to do justice. I want you to treat people rightly regardless of their vulnerability. Don't take advantage of people. Treat people rightly regardless of of their vulnerability. We have an amazing opportunity as a church to do that these days. Not just a church talking about Utica. I'm talking about God's people, the church. There are, there are still thousands and thousands of, of refugees who are in crisis. I read an article this week that said, in the history of the world, now that's a pretty good introduction, right? That, 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 should, get our, that should get our attention. In the history of of the world, there has never been a time when there have been more people displaced from their home. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think those people are vulnerable? Do you think that God would have His people to minister to those people? Treat people rightly, regardless of their vulnerability. Don't take advantage of people. Demonstrate God's justice to them. As you look at verse 9 in in, in chapter 2, that that verse that talks about uh, the women being driven out of their delightful houses, I can't help but mention just this this one very specific point of application, and and that is uh, if you happen to be in the, the, the business of rental properties, this is one area where God's people need to do justice. Do, do not take advantage of people. Uh, you, you may not be driving people out of their delightful houses, but you might be keeping them from having a delightful house because of the way that you carry out your business. So this is just a reminder that we should treat people rightly regardless. Regardless of their vulnerability, what it means to do justice is to treat people Rightly, but that's not the only thing that we see. We also, we also see another, another uh, instance of this. Look at the beginning of chapter 2. Move backwards a little bit. Look at the first couple of verses of chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. So why is it that they do this wickedness? Because they can. That's the description that God is giving them there. So as we we think about what it means to do justice in our life, another example of that or another principle in carrying that out is not just to treat people rightly, regardless of their vulnerability, but also to wield power rightly, regardless of of your visibility. We're talking about people and their vulnerability, but now we're talking about wielding power rightly regardless of your visibility. Now, some of you, I can almost hear your brains working right now, and you're thinking, okay, you look at this, you look at this sub point here, and you think, okay, he's talking about wielding power rightly, and you're, you automatically check out because you're like, I don't, I'm not in a position of power. But let me remind us, all of us have some kind of power over somebody. Parents have power over their children. Uh, Children, in many cases, have power over their brothers and sisters. We find find ourselves in, in situations at work where we have power over people, maybe not in the idea of authority, But think about it this way, the idea of ability. And here these people were devising wickedness and working evil on their beds. And when morning came, they're performing it because it is in their power. It is in the power of their hand. They are not wielding their power rightly. And for many of us, the temptation is... If nobody else is seeing me, why does it matter? If I can get away with it, why does it matter? Or go to the other extreme of visibility. 
Here he's talking to the rulers of Israel. So let's talk about those of us who are certainly not invisible, but let's talk about those of us who find ourselves in situations during the week in which we are so visible that our authority and our power should be obvious to those around us. And the word to us this morning is, wield that power rightly. Now, i, I got to confess a little silly illustration to you. Wednesday afternoon, I think it was Wednesday, Tuesday afternoon, I'm walking around. You know, sometimes you just, you just have a hankering for something sweet. You just need something sweet. I had a cup of coffee. I needed something sweet on Tuesday afternoon. And I, I had to admit to you, I, I went down to the preschool music room thinking, surely somebody left a box of donuts in there. I mean, we had, we had nine million donuts Sunday morning. Surely there's, a, there's one box of donuts in there. And Tanya did a really good job cleaning up after donuts with Dad. So there were, no, there were no boxes of donuts in the preschool music room. But I came back, and I'm walking through the connector. And I saw on the preschool connector desk two little baggies. And one of them had a Reese cup in there. <laughs> now, if you, if you know me, I mean, like, that's my kryptonite. One of them had a Reese cup in there, and it, it didn't have a name on it. It was, it was just a little baggie, and quite honestly, it was almost like behind the computer monitor. And so you know what I did? I took it. And I opened that little baggie. And I got that Reese cup. And the Lord said, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm studying Micah this week. And in my, in my thought, I'm thinking, well, number one, nobody's here. And somebody just left it. And number two, I am the pastor. <laughs> I mean, I'm just confession time here. But I did not eat the Reese cup. I put it back. I didn't open the Reese cup, by the way. I, I, I told that story to my, to my accountability partners, and they were like, you opened it up and put it back? I said, no, I opened the baggie. But I know that's a silly illustration. I know, that's, I know that is so small, but if we're not going to be faithful in small things, how can the Lord entrust us to bigger things? Part of what it means to do justice is to do the right thing regardless, to treat people rightly regardless of their vulnerability, and to wield power rightly regardless of our visibility. I, I hope that you do better on that check than your pastor did this week. The Lord has a lot of work to do on our hearts because He doesn't want us to be a people who just likes the idea of justice and champions the concept of justice. He wants us to do justice. He wants us to do the right thing. But look back at Micah 6, 8 again. Let's, let, let's, let's move on to the second part. He says, do justice and love kindness. Love kindness. Now, obviously, in the, in the song that we sang this morning, we sang it a little bit different. We said uh, to, to love mercy. But here in the English Standard Version, it says to, to love kindness. Now, this, this particular truth point is not steeped in a deep exegesis here. There's actually not any more verses that I want to talk about other than the fact that, that we need to love kindness. We need to see some of the irony here because the word that is translated kindness in Micah 6.8 is the word hesed. You've, you've probably heard me talk about that, that wonderful word hesed in the Old Testament. It is that word for which we don't have an English word that measures up. And that's why you have so many different translations of that word all throughout Scripture. We, we hear mercy, we hear kindness, we hear compassion. Uh, here in the book of Micah, uh, in, in chapter 7 and verse 20, it, it says, You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abram. That is that same word, hesed, steadfast love. So, church, I want you to hear the irony here. God basically says, I want you to do justice 
and I want you to love, love. I want you to love, love. One of the things we can ask ourselves as we think about what this might look like in our lives is, Lord, for me, is compassion, is mercy, is kindness a duty or is it a delight? And we need to let compassion be a delight rather than a duty. God doesn't, He didn't just say, carry this out, demonstrate this, make this visible in your life. He said, love kindness. We need to be delighted with kindness. We need to be delighted with mercy. Now, many of you are involved in many of our mercy ministries. As I said, we have, we have ministry opportunities at Our Daily Bread. We have ministry opportunities at Our Daily Rest. Uh, we, we give to, to Safe Harbor, and we give to Collins Children's Home, and we do benevolence ministry here at the church. We have lots of opportunities to demonstrate God's kindness to people around us. But the question is, are we doing that because we think we're supposed to do that? Or are we doing that? Are we showing kindness and extending mercy and compassion because we love to do that? And church, one of the things that I would remind us of is that we will grow in our love for demonstrating kindness to people around us as we grow in our recognition of God's kindness in our life, God's mercy in our life, God's steadfast love in our life. So as we continue... To, to fill out the forms for the nominating team. As we, as we continue to, to think about these volunteer ministry opportunities, and as, as some of you uh, kind of begin to, to think about and pray about, Lord, would you have me to go and to work in Awana uh, next year on Wednesday nights? Would you, would you have me to join this ministry or that ministry? I just want to remind you that, that one of God's three requirements is not just that we do the right thing, but that we love doing the right thing, that we don't do it out of obligation. You remember that phrase from Hosea where, where God was talking to His people and He said, no longer call me master, call me your husband. I, I want to be in that love relationship. So we, we must not demonstrate kindness and compassion and mercy in our life just because we feel like we have to. Compassion should be a delight rather than a duty. Look again at, at Micah 6, 8. Let's look at the third verbal imperative there. Do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Uh, one of the ways that I like to, to explain the importance of humility and God's call for humility is that we would remember the seesaw of God's law. We need to remember the seesaw of God's law. This is, uh, th is kind of just the way I interpret this, the way I visualize this. So if it's helpful, good, hold on to that. If it's not helpful, uh, just hold on to the words. But this is kind of how I view it here. We, we see this, this seesaw or what some of you might call a, a teeter-totter. How many of you are teeter-totter people rather than seesaw? How many, how many of you call it a teeter-totter? Right, how, many, how many seesaws? All right, so in South Carolina, it's a seesaw apparently. So we have, this, we have this seesaw, and on one side, we have what we do for ourselves. And on the other side of the fulcrum, that's that center point there, on the other side, we have what God will do for us. And then this is how it works. If we decide that we want to exalt ourselves. We want to pump ourselves up. We want to lift ourselves up. We want to brag. We want to make sure that we're getting the best position in everything that we're doing. If we exalt ourselves, look what happens to the seesaw. God says, okay, you exalt yourself, I'm going to humble you. That's the seesaw of God's law. Flip it around a little bit. This is what happens if we instead humble ourselves. 
This is what the Scripture tells us. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. This is the seesaw of God's law. This is the way that it works. If you will humble yourself, you don't have to worry about living your life down there in the dirt because if you will humble yourself, God will lift you up. That is the seesaw of God's law. That is the way it works. Humility leads to exaltation. If we will live a life of humility, if we will walk humbly with God, He will lift us up. Let me take you back to chapter 2. Let me demonstrate this uh, through, through Micah. Look at the first verse of chapter 2 again. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. And remember, these are the people who, who, who do this wickedness because it is in their power to do it. They do it because they can do it. And they're devising wickedness. Now look down to verse 3. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising disaster. Now what I want you to notice there is what they're doing in verse 1, they're lifting themselves up and the way they're doing it is they're devising wickedness. They're lifting themselves up by devising wickedness for those that are around them. And God said, okay, remember the seesaw of my law. Therefore, because because you're devising wickedness, I'm going to devise disaster for your life. Now, in the original language, those words are identical, both of them. They are devising disaster for others so they can lift themselves up. And God says, the seesaw of my law says... I'm going to devise disaster for your life. And notice what the result of that is at the end of verse 3. And you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. Church, if we live a life where we're always worried about our own standing, we're always trying to grab on to something else for ourselves, we're trying to get a leg up for ourselves, God says, I will make sure that your leg is down. I will make sure that you are humiliated. I will make sure that you are lowered, but if you will humble yourself, God will lift you up. That, the, the, those verses that Phil read earlier from Philippians chapter 2, let me just pick up where he left off. Listen to verses 8 and 9 of Philippians chapter 2 talking about Jesus, talking about the ultimate example of humility. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So Jesus humbled himself. And because of that, because of God's law, because of the seesaw of God's law, God exalted him. And that's what God is calling us to. To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Now, let me take you into Micah's world as we, as we bring this to a close. Let me, let me see if you can find some, some similarity between, between where Micah was and where you sometimes find yourself. Remember, Micah was in this situation because he was, he was God's mouthpiece. He's the one that, that God wanted to use to get the word out to all those other people. And how many times in your life do you feel like all those other people just don't get it. And it begins to, to weigh on you. Look at, look at the way it weighed on Micah. Look at chapter 7. Kind of look at his emotional state in chapter 7. And just let me ask you if this sounds familiar sometimes in your life. Woe is me. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, and when the grapes have been gleaned, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth. I mean, church, do you ever feel like that as you look around and you see all the injustice in the world, and you see all the cruelty where there should be kindness, and you see all of the the conceit where there should be humility? Do you ever... Do you ever wonder like Micah did? Do you ever say that the godly have perished from the earth? There's, there's no one upright. 
among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net, and their hands are on what is evil to do it well. You ever feel like that? You know what Micah did about that? Skip down to verse 7. This is Micah saying, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. Yeah, it's discouraging, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. And notice how he ends this book. Fast forward to verse 18. Who is a God like you? By the way, that's what the name Micah means. Who is like Yahweh? He says, God, who, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. And he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea and you will show faithfulness to Jacob. And steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. And here is Micah saying those things and not really knowing how God's going to do that. He's looking from the other side of the cross and he doesn't know how he's going to do that, but he points to it anyway. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. This is the solution to the problem, church. This is where our hope is found. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Now look at that. The birth of Jesus in and of itself demonstrates the seesaw of God's law. Because God raised up Jesus Christ out of Bethlehem Ephrathah, out of this tribe that amounted to nothing. And out of this tribe that amounted to nothing came Jesus. Notice verse 4. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be our peace. If you ever have one of those days like Micah was having, and you look around and you say, Lord, there's, there's nobody else who's doing the right thing. Remember, that's why he sent Jesus. Because you know who else is among those who are not doing the right thing, who aren't always doing justice, who aren't always loving kindness, who aren't always walking humbly? You know who's among that number? I'm among that number. You're among that number, and that's why God sent Jesus to save us from our sins and to rule over us in peace. Church, do justice. Don't, let's not just talk about it. Let's do justice. Let's not just show kindness because we're supposed to. Let's show kindness because we love to. Because 